are able to be together this morning. Um, to those who are joining us online, we have people traveling and we have some people sick. Um, greetings to you. We are praying for you and we are glad that you are with us as well. Um, so I have a devotional book that I have been reading um, since I was in college, so forever ago. Um, I bought it in 1995, and there are sections of the book that aren't even attached anymore. Um, but it has become so much more to me than just a daily reading. It inspires me to dive deeply into the scriptures that are shared um, each and every day. I have notations in it, like when Chris and I got engaged. Um, and in the front flap, I have my welcome speech that I would give when I traveled and taught different classes. That's actually faded and barely able to be read anymore. Um, but this means a lot to me. And several years ago, I started to make notations around the devotion on what stood out to me. And I have things highlighted in different colored pens for the different year that I made the notations. But on April 18th of 2022, I wrote the words, be ready, live ready. And the scripture verse for that day was out of Exodus 3, 4. And it says, God called to him and he said, here I am. And this is Moses' reply to God. And I underlined these thoughts. Readiness means having a right relationship to God. He has to be your foundation so that when he calls you, you're ready to move. I also underlined readiness for God means that we are prepared to do the smallest thing or the largest thing. Jesus Christ expects to do with us as his father did with him. A ready person never needs to get ready. He is ready. And I will tell you, this idea of living ready pierced my heart. I actually created a tiny little logo that I sent off to Kate and Tony. And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know what you think about this. But live ready so you don't have to scramble. Live ready so you're standing on a solid foundation no matter what, no matter where you go or what you do or what happens. When you're living ready, it's the greatest foundation or the greatest example that you are walking with Jesus, that you have taken his yoke upon you and that he is leading you. And for the past two years, this concept has been integrated into messages it's a rather easy thing to do because it is already integrated throughout all of the scriptures. And God has been doing a mighty work in us as the River Church, as individuals in this process. We have been able to grow in our prayer life. We have grown relationally. We have grown in our gifts. We've walked through trials and hardships. We've learned the beauty of surrender. We've felt the sting of disappointment and heartache, and we have celebrated victories. We've learned to let go of what we do not need, but we have also learned the joy of letting go even more so that God alone continues to be the one that we cling to. And through it all, he's been with us. And now he has seen fit to move us. That is an emotional thing to say. To provide a space that is going to be consistent. And when I think about consistency, we can't equate that to comfort. Um, we are not being moved so that we will be comfortable we are being moved so that we will learn new and beautiful ways to surrender even more. So that God can reveal himself to us in new and beautiful ways as well. It's only because of Jesus. And I want to stand here and say to you guys, we are ready for this next step. We are ready because God has held this door open for us. So as we step forward, we're going to continue to dig deep into our knowledge of God because he alone has to be the one that we stand on and stand for, right? All right, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we come before you this morning and it is an honor. It is an honor to 
be able to take these next steps. And we don't believe that they're going to be easy, but we believe that there is joy that is going to be uncovered in ways that we cannot even imagine. And Lord, as we continue to grow in our knowledge of you, as we continue to surrender to you, as we continue to fix our eyes on you, may we remain humble, may we remain moldable and teachable, because even in this, what we think it might look like, you already know what it's going to look like. And we want to avoid any stumbling blocks because we get in the way. We, we think we have it all figured out, and, well, we don't. And so, Lord, we thank you that you are moving, that you are laying the foundation, that you are preparing us in ways that we don't even know right now. And we thank you for that because you are good, you are gracious, you are generous, and we just rejoice in this ability to give you praise and to give you glory and honor. And we just invite the Holy Spirit into this space. Lord, just fill every nook and cranny, fill every person present so that it is you that we are hearing from, that it is your words that are spoken. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So it is an interesting thing to segue into our text for today, but it is also remarkably perfect. Um, it is perfect because Paul is going to address the greatest stumbling block in a believer's life, a hindrance to living ready, and that is hypocrisy. I know that is a tough word, um, but it is an even tougher way to navigate life. So we're in tax season, something we all love, right? Um, so a fitting way to describe what Paul does in this week's text is to say that hypocrisy is going to undergo an audit. And through the process, Paul breaks down what is truly profitable in the lives of the readers at the church in Rome compared to what is believed to be profitable. And he's going to reveal throughout that the ultimate gain of life, if you will, the ultimate gain is only made possible because of the righteousness of God that is extended to us and received by us in faith. Now, Paul is believed to have written this letter to the Romans during his time in Corinth, Greece. And I think a little backstory might be helpful for us to better understand the tension that is existing in Rome, in the Roman church, during this time. So according to the book of Acts, Priscilla and Aquila, Jewish Christians from Rome that Paul met during his ministry in Corinth, were, as you might remember, this husband and wife tent-making team. And they landed in Corinth because the emperor of Rome at the time, Claudius, had ordered all of the Jews to leave. And you can read about that in Acts 18. Well, there was this first century Roman historian named Suetonius who reported that Claudius did this because of Jewish conflict over Christ. There was fighting and arguing in Rome between the Jews who had embraced Jesus as their Messiah and the Jews who had not. So his solution was just to ask all of the Jews to leave. And Priscilla and Aquila were among those people. So the removal of Jewish Christians, though, then left the leadership of the church in the hands of the Gentile Christians. So when Claudius's decree ended, when he died, many Jewish, return, Jewish people returned home, and they came face to face with the vast cultural differences between themselves and the Gentile believers. They disagreed how these two very different groups were supposed to follow Jesus together. They couldn't figure out, like, how do the non-Jews keep the Sabbath? Are they supposed to eat kosher too? I mean, these were big cultural differences impacting this body of believers. And the tension that is going on, it is evident in Paul's letter to them, but it is a letter that he wrote with the desire that they would be able to become unified. He wants the Roman church to grasp that the gospel reveals God's righteousness. God's righteousness allows for all of humanity to live in this new and awesome way because God's promise to Israel was fulfilled because of Jesus. 
So this divided church can become unified because of Jesus under the headship of Jesus Christ. So he opens his letter with this truth. He's like, God alone does what is just, and he is the only one who keeps his promises. And no matter how good you think you are, well, you can't do that like he can. So in chapter 1, Paul highlighted the Gentiles, and he explains that what they could have known about God, because it was made evident to them by God, well, they chose to ignore it. And so while they're walking around and they're claiming to be wise, they're actually looking like fools because they're trading the glory of God for other things. They're choosing to worship what the world had to offer instead of God. So God does something pretty big. He gives them over to those things in both body and mind. And Paul was very specific in what those things are. And the truth is, we all fall into one or more of those categories that Paul shared. And I would encourage you to take some time and reread Romans 1, verses 26 through 31. See, God's not going to force you to follow him. He's not going to force you to worship him or honor him with your body or your mind. But the farther that you walk from him, the harder that it becomes to hear him, And the easier it is to become entangled with the sin of the world and actually become hardened or blind to the fact that the things that you're doing are sin at all. So chapter 1 ended with this, verse 32. Although they know God's just sentence, that those who practice such things, everything in verses 26 through 31, deserve to die, they not only do them, but even applaud others who practice them. So not only are they living a life of sin, they're celebrating, they're cheering on other people who are living a life of sin. So Paul, a smart guy, he is fully aware that the Jewish reader at this point is probably thinking, preach it, Paul. Like you see what We see in the Gentiles, you see how terrible they are. How are we supposed to do life with them? Well, then he addresses them, specifically and ironically, their judgment of the Gentiles. So in verse 2, or chapter 2, verse 1, he says, Therefore, every one of you who judges is without excuse. For when you judge another, you condemn yourself, since you the judge, do the same things. Now we know that God's judgment on those who do such things is based on the truth. Do you think any one of you who judges those who do such things yet do the same, that you will escape God's judgment? Paul's saying, hey, (laughs) if you want to judge what the Gentiles do, but you, in your own way, you're doing the same thing, you're no different. And I'm certainly not going to ask you guys to raise your hands and say I do that all the time, but think about when you judge someone, small things, big things, because you think they do something you'd never do. Paul's point is, it might look different, but you too do what you ought not to do. So today, Paul is going to continue to address the Jewish reader specifically with this sobering reality. He's like, I hate to tell you this, but you're actually more guilty than the Gentiles because you have the law. See, it's a dangerous thing to be thinking you're right or you're better or you're entitled even because of a standard of measurement that you expect other people to follow when that same standard is one that you yourself fall short of. You just might fall short in private. See, Paul helps to show them this reality by creatively and bluntly taking a dive into their cultural assets and their cultural deficits through his audit of hypocrisy. So often, we look at our assets as gains, right? I mean, that absolutely makes sense from a tax perspective. But when our assets are misused, maybe even abused, can they actually become deficits? 
Paul's point is to show them hypocrisy, well, that's taken over the way that you are living your entire life and therefore how you are treating those that you are meant to be doing life with. And he touches a nerve as he addresses what can only be described as the overly confident hypocrite. A title I think, you know, we'd all love to have attached to our name, right? Sally Smith, confident hypocrite. Well, why is this revelation important? Why is it important that we talk about hypocrisy? Because it is impossible to stand in the light of God's righteousness with the shadow of our hypocrisy in the way. It's a barrier between us and God that needs to be broken if we're going to receive God's best for us. So Jesus, he addressed hypocrisy using some pretty strong words in Matthew 23. He said, don't be like whitewashed tombs, beautiful on the outside, but filled with dead men's bones on the inside. He's like, you might look good, but you're spiritually dead. This painful but perfect visual shows us the deep impact hypocrisy has. So as hard as it is to think about, but I think it's important that we do, the best way to visualize the depth of what Paul is addressing today would be to envision an unsaved person wearing the mask of a believer. Paul's talking to the people who, as he says in 2 Timothy, have a form of godliness. They do resemble God in some ways, but they deny his power in their life. They think they have the power. It's sort of like a hollow chocolate Easter bunny that you think is solid, but when you take a big old bite out of it, All you get is air. It's an illusion, and I would say a disappointment. See, no one is going to knowingly choose to go to a hypocrite for solid life advice, right? Therefore, it is important that we come to terms with the hypocrisy within ourselves if we are going to be authentic representations of Jesus to the world because our hypocrisy is really damaging when we don't. So let's take a look at the first couple of verses of our text for today. Romans 2, 17 through 24. Now, if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God and know his will and approve the things that are superior, being instructed from the law, And if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light to those in darkness, an instructor of the ignorant, a teacher of the immature, having the embodiment of knowledge and truth in the law, you then who teach another, don't you teach yourself? You who preach you must not steal, do you steal? You who say you must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who detest idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? For it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. You know, it's as if Paul knows that the religious crowd is really going to have some strong feelings as a result of everything that he has written to them up to this point. They're going to be like, yo, like, how can you say that stuff to us? We're God's chosen people. So he addresses those things, and wisely, he begins with what they're doing right. Then he segues into where they're falling short, and in the end, he gives his overall analysis. See, in the text we just read, Paul listed eight things that the religious people believe they are doing right. And we're not going to state them all again, but through those things, he is confirming that they have a rich calling on their lives. They are Jewish. They are God's chosen people. This is something to take pride in, absolutely. The word Jew is shortened from the word Judah, one of the tribes of Israel, from one of the sons of Jacob. The word Judah means praise 
to Yahweh. That is their name. And they celebrated that, that of all the people in the world, God chose them to give him praise. And they identified with that. This was seen in the way that they um, separated themselves from the Gentiles. When they were introducing themselves, they would attach the word Jew as a second name. They'd say something like, John Smith, Jew, nice to meet you. They wanted to make sure that they were known as being Jewish. So Paul's saying, great, you are a Jew. But even a great thing can become a tarnished thing if it keeps you from the very best thing. And in their case, their identity as a Jew, which is a great thing, was keeping them from fully surrendering to the best thing, which was Jesus, because they were still looking at it as if being Jewish ranked higher than following Jesus. He was a great add-on, but they were Jews. So I was blessed to have been born into a family where my aunts and my uncles, my grandparents, my parents, they believed in Jesus. But just because my family members identify as Christians, well, that didn't make me one by default. My family heritage, it certainly gave me a solid platform to stand on and spring off of. But I had to decide if I was going to make my heritage my reality. Like I wasn't going to scoot into heaven holding onto the coattails of my grandpa's jacket. Like this two-for-one special. So yes, it is great that they're Jewish. It is a powerful asset. But that doesn't give them a free ride. Verse 18 shows us another asset. He says, you know his will. You know the will of God. How do you know the will of God? By being instructed by the law. They know God because they have the law, the Torah, the first five books of Moses. But the specific use of the word law here actually refers to the entire New Testament. They have everything that they need to have to understand. So Paul's like, you're Jewish? You have the most important book on the planet to instruct you. This is cool. See, a little insight into just how much the law would have been valued by a Jewish person at this time. Their toddlers would learn something called the Shema toddlers, like little three-year-olds. It's a three-paragraph long um, thing that they would memorize, and it begins with the words, Hear, O Israel, God is our Lord, God is one. So imagine little toddlers running around their house quoting this, the Shema. By the time they were five, they would begin studying the scriptures. They would memorize the Hallel Psalms. Those are numbers 113 through 118, so a lot of it. And these were known as the pilgrim psalms. These are things that they would share with one another as they made their way to Jerusalem. So that's what a five-year-old is doing. When they were six, they were sent to the synagogue. They would learn to read and to write only using the Torah. And by 12, if you were a girl, 13, if you were a boy, you would be presented to your community as someone who is accountable and committed to following the law of the Lord. So the law was super important to them, and they all knew it. And because of that, they fully understood what they were called by God to do, which is their third asset, the best thing that they have going for them. In verse 19, Paul says, And if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light to those in darkness, an instructor of the ignorant, a teacher of the immature, having the embodiment and knowledge and truth in the law. See, God's original design was that the Jewish people would be ambassadors to the world. Having been giving the law, they were meant to share it. They were meant to instruct those who didn't have it and grow and become spiritually immature. And we see this calling on their life all the way back in Isaiah, in chapter 42, beginning in verse 6. It says, I am the Lord. I have called you Jewish person for a righteous purpose. And I will hold you by your hand. I will watch over you and I will appoint you. I will be a covenant for the people and a light to the nations in order to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from their dungeon and those sitting in darkness from the prison house. I am the Lord. That is my name. And I will not give my glory to another. 
or my praise to idols. That was the call on the Jewish person's life. But we also know that they did not receive Jesus immediately, right? Some of them, not at all. So because of that, that call was then spread to the Gentiles. So as a Gentile believer, you and I, we have a call too. And that is seen in Matthew 5, verse 14. You are the light of the world. A city situated on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather on a lamp stand. And it gives light for all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. So Paul, he's highlighting this amazing foundation that they have. But now he is going to transition into what they need to work on, where their hypocrisy is actually being made evident to the world. He says in verse 21, You then who teach another, don't you teach yourself. You who preach, you must not steal, do you steal. You who say you must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery. You who detest idols, do you rob temples. You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law. While they had the law, all the knowledge of it up in their head, They were not actually living it out. They were really great at holding it over other people's heads, but they weren't practicing what they were preaching. Hypocrisy. So Chris and I are in the joyous time of our lives where we are instructing our twin daughters in the fine art of driving. Yes, and uh, let me tell you, You are never under a greater level of scrutiny than when you have someone learning to drive sitting as your passenger. Two hands on the wheel, Mom. You didn't use your blinker, Mom. Mom, you just took both hands off the wheel. Chris called me out on this, too. I apparently talk with my hands a lot, even when I drive. Um, I admit that is no good. Um... I know the truth in my head, but bad habits have numbed me to the reality that I don't always practice what I'm preaching, and it doesn't matter if I've been driving for 30 plus years or not, those rules still and forever will apply to me. But the same is true for us as believers. Like, we can't scoot on past the verses we don't want to know so that we can live however we want to live. We are all accountable to the entirety of the scriptures, by the way, whether you choose to read them or not. So they have the right call on their life. They just aren't practicing it well. Luke 6, 46 says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things I say? He's like, why do you use my name but not live as I'm asking you to live? He says, I will show you what someone who is like who comes to me, hears my words and acts on them. He's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. When the flood came, the river crashed against that house and couldn't shake it because it was well built. See, they were living ready. Their foundation in Christ secure. That's who they were standing on. But verse 49 says, but the one who hears and does not act is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The river crashed against it and immediately it collapsed and the destruction of that house was great. See, Jesus has a lot of followers in the social media sense of the word. A lot of people know who he is. A lot of people are familiar with his name, and they use it in unkind ways when they're angry. Jesus even has a lot of likes on some of his posts or parables. But Jesus doesn't have a lot of real friends that want to do life with him and put into practice what he teaches. They use his name, 
They look somewhat like him, but the discrepancies are glaring. That's hypocrisy. So as a result of the way they're living, the Jewish believer actually has a really crummy reputation. Romans 2.24 says, For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. That is a sobering verse to read. A verse we have to put ourselves in. The name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. See, a hypocrite gives God a bad name. It gives the world the opportunity to justifiably ridicule that person, the church. We don't like to hear that. We really don't like to hear that. We know it in our heart, but we don't like to hear it. We like to do a little dance between the world and our faith, kind of like the game of hopscotch, right? But when you are hopping on one foot, it's really easy to lose your balance. Your foundation is not secure. We do things that might not be wrong in the world's view, but at the same time, those things don't reflect the character and the nature of Christ. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. Sure, I can do all sorts of things, but just because I can doesn't mean I should. This is a question that I'm going to ask, and I don't want to ask it flippantly. But what does Jesus' death on the cross mean to you? Does it mean live now, ask for forgiveness later? Does it mean, I know Jesus, I know what he did, it's all good, I've got plenty of time to make it right. Do you? <laughs> Does that position you to move when God calls you? Will you even hear him? Because it's a slippery slope how quickly we can turn from God when our eyes are not glued to Jesus Christ. And that happens when you're not practicing what you preach. They have this bad reputation. We can have a bad reputation. And Paul is going to show them that the reason for both of those things is that they actually have the wrong perspective. Verse 25. He says, circumcision benefits you if you observe the law. But if you are a lawbreaker, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. So if an uncircumcised man keeps the law's requirements, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? A man who is physically uncircumcised but who keeps the law will judge you who are a lawbreaker in spite of having the letter of the law and circumcision. See, circumcision was meant to symbolize a commitment to God. It was an outward change representing an inward change. However, if you were circumcised but you weren't actually following God, well, what value did that act have? What was happening among the Jewish people was that they were looking at circumcision like an insurance policy against God's wrath. Some fire protection, if you will. And this is actually evident in some sayings that some of the rabbis of the time had. We have two examples. The rabbis would say, circumcised men do not descend into Gehenna, which is another word for hell. Or circumcision will deliver all of Israel from hell. In other words, just make sure you're circumcised. This one act becomes a substitute for all other acts of obedience. Well, Paul's highlighting if you break the law, something you say means so much to you, your circumcision, which you're basing your eternity in heaven on, well, it's as if it never happened. Verse 28, for a person is not a Jew who is one outwardly, and true circumcision is not something visible in the flesh. 
our relationship with God is not based on what other people see. I mean, sure, our love of God should be evident in the things that we do, right? But what we do alone doesn't mean our heart is in the right place. James talked a lot about that. Hypocrisy is wearing a mask that represents who you want the world to think you are. It's an illusion. It's that hollow chocolate bunny, but it holds no kingdom value. Verse 29, on the contrary, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is of the heart, by the spirit, not the letter. That person's praise is not from people, but from God. See, it doesn't matter if the people around you think you are the bee's knees. I wish Leah were here. She loves the bee's knees. (laughs) Barry B. Benson. You guys seen the bee movie? Anyway, side note, she loves it. Um, in the end, it is God's assessment that counts. Why is it, though, that we strive so hard to live for the approval of other people? And our actions so often are rooting and getting as much praise from other people as we can. Like, are we good? Are we good? Now, obviously, if you've offended someone, you need to make it right. But we strive to be approved by other people. Growing up, I heard the phrase, and I will be honest, I did not like it then, but it is the same phrase that I have thought of many times in my adult life. If Jesus was visibly sitting next to you, would you make the decision you're contemplating making right now? He is there, but because we can't see him, he's sort of out of sight, out of mind. Our hypocrisy might fool people for a while, but it never fools God. You can look the part, but it doesn't count if the part doesn't match the heart. So remember the word Jew or Judah means praise. Look at how Paul ends his chapter. He says, ultimately, our praise, our Jewishness, will not come from people, but from God. Romans 1, the whole encapsulation of Romans 1 is to tell us that no one is so bad, a.k.a. the Gentile, that they can't be saved. Romans 2 is saying no one is so good that they don't need to be saved. No matter who you are, what you have, what you've done, no matter what other people believe about you, everyone needs a Savior. We're going to end with Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord. So they knew him. They knew his name. They'll say, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we drive out demons in your name and do miracles in your name? They worked for him. Then it says, then I will announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you law breaker. See, we can't use Jesus' name for our glory. There is no eternal value in in hypocrisy. There is no eternal gain. You know, when you think about, we... Chris and I walk our our dog all the time in this little cemetery by our house. And I am fascinated by the gravestones, their birth date and their death date. And I don't know if you guys do this, but you wonder about that person's life. You wonder, like, why did you die when you were 17? Why why did you die when you were 14? You know, graves back to the 1800s. And we've said this before, but that little dash between your birth date and your death date is obviously your entire life. I would just encourage you not to waste your dash, not to waste your life catering to the world, to live in the shadows of hypocrisy and live in the shadows of trying to be something when God wants you to bask in his light. He wants you to bask in the very best that he has for you. And when you're so caught up in trying to look like something else, you're going to miss what he has. And the only way that you're going to know who you are is by knowing who Jesus is. 
He is your creator. He is your father. He is the perfect one who knows every hair on your head. When you know Jesus, you will know yourself and you will be able to live ready. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we have so much to be grateful for. And it is not because we have a building, although I will tell you that is a nice little cherry on top. But Lord, we have so much to be grateful for. You are worthy of our praise each and every day. You are worthy of us living in abundant joy each and every day. I pray that that just seeps into our souls, that that seeps into our mind, that that weaves its way into the DNA of our very beings. You have called us to do some great things. And the only way that you are going to get the glory is if we are out of the way. And so, Lord, I pray that this week, in big ways, in little ways, in ways that we're ready for, because that's the only way that you work, is when we're ready. I pray that you would reveal more of yourself to us. If there's things that we need to work off, may we not be afraid of that. But as Michael said earlier, may we face it head on and be honest with ourselves so that we can get that out of our lives and create more space for you. Lord, we thank you that we are able to come to the table, that we are able to freely worship you, that we are able to remember exactly what this bread and this juice represents. We do need to ask ourselves, what did your death on the cross mean? What does that mean? Does that mean that we can live how we want? Or does that mean that we need to live for you? You underwent horrendous things for us so that we could stand in the light of your righteousness. Lord, we thank you for that. If you have committed your life to Jesus, if he is the one that you are striving to live for, not perfectly, but that you are striving to live for, this table is the place for you to come and remember and to celebrate and to receive the body and the juice knowing that his righteousness covers you. Mike and Patty are going to administer the elements. When you're ready, please feel free to come forward. Um, when I was a, a kid and I was learning to swim, my dad would go out into the deep end and he would stand with his arms up and he'd be like, just jump in. I have you. And I'd be so afraid that he would drop me. Um, but he never did. And when we're thinking about having to overcome things in our lives, we look at it like how someone in the world might look at it, like they might shame us or ridicule us or make us feel silly for doing the thing that we did. But Jesus is standing there with his arms open saying, just jump, and he's going to catch you. We love you guys. You are troopers for traveling through Romans with us. Um, we are excited for what God is doing. And if you are able to stay and help us move a few things, we'd appreciate that too. All right. Have a great week, everybody.